And we acknowledge the first peoples of the nations where we each are as the custodians of the country on which we're meeting. We pay we our pay respect, our respect to, their to their elders, past, past and, and present, present, and, and thank them for their, their care of care. the land. The uh, prayer that we have is like a prayer poem or a poetic prayer. It comes from Benedictus, a book of blessings by John O'Donoghue. It has a focus on a theme that is relevant to what we're looking at in the passage tonight. In the beginning, the word was read and the sound was thunder and the wound in the unseen spilled forth the red weather of being. In the name of the fire, the flame and the love, praise the pure presence of fire that burns from within without thought of time. The hunger of fire has no need for the reliquy of the future. It adores the eros of now where the memory of the earth in flames that lick and drink the air is made to release its long enduring forms in a powder of ashes left for the wind to decipher. As air intensifies the hunger of fire, may the thought of death breathe new urgency into our love of life. As fire cleanses dross, may the flame of passion burn away what is false. As short as the time from spark to flame, so brief may the distance be between heart and being. May we discover beneath our fear embers of anger to kindle justice. May courage cause our lives to flame in the name of the fire and the flame and the light. So tonight, um, although we're following the lectionary passages, the gospel passages for Advent each uh, week as we go through this and tonight although the lectionary uh, uses just the last part of Jesus speech in chapter 21 of Luke we're actually tonight going to look at the whole of that chapter to get the whole context of it and to dig into some of the issues that are raised in what uh, is recorded there. We actually had the beginning of this speech if you're following the lectionary about two weeks ago where as we got to the end of the Mark cycle um, it's chapter 13 of Mark and Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple talking about the temple and uh, the fact that it was going to be destroyed uh, and I put the map up there so you can see that the Mount of Olives is uh, to the east of Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley looking across to the temple on the Temple Mount. Now Mark says that Jesus is sitting opposite the temple across on the, on the Mount of Olives and one of the things we're going to notice, and um, from the material that you have been sent, uh, you'll see we're looking at Luke's account in parallel with Mark's account. One of the things that we'll notice is that Luke actually has Jesus still in the temple saying this when he talks about the temple being destroyed. And in fact, Luke, like Mark and Matthew, has had Jesus enter Jerusalem and then go into the temple and that famous scene where Jesus begins to drive out those who were selling things in the uh, forecourt of the temple uh, and then Luke says that every day he was teaching in the temple and in chapter 20 one day as he was teaching the people in the temple and telling the good news and then there's a series of encounters or debates that happen between Jesus and scribes and Pharisees and uh, priests in, in the temple arena. Uh, and that runs through. And then um, J Jesus is still in the temple. And Luke says in verse five of chapter 21, when some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, he, he gave this speech there in that temple. Um, here's a, an artist's imagining of what the temple would have looked like at its height. The first temple, the Temple of Solomon had been destroyed in the exile, the events leading to the exile. And then under, Nea, uh, under Ezra and Nehemiah, when people returned to Jerusalem, they rebuilt and made even bigger the temple. And that's what it might have looked like. And on the left hand side is the floor plan of the temple. And uh, you can see the inner uh, building and then the larger outer court, what's called the court of the Gentiles. Gentiles were allowed into that area of the temple and that presumably that 
open airspace there is where the um, overturning of the temp of the tables in the temple and the releasing of the doves would have happened that's recorded in the gospels but then when you go inside you're into the court of women so only jews are allowed inside and women are only allowed into the court of women and then men are allowed into the court of priests and that's where the altar is where the burnt offerings and sacrifices are made and then behind the um curtain into the holy place the holy of holies is, is where only the priests were to to enter so that's some um, the the setting for this speech and even today we can we don't have to imagine we can see uh the scene that jesus was envisaging because in the year 70 the temple was invaded or jerusalem was invaded and the temple was burnt and much of it was destroyed and that destruction, this is a modern picture, so that destruction uh, still exists to today. Uh, on, on the top part, uh, because Jerusalem for a long time had been a Muslim city, there is a mosque, as you know, where, where the temple would have stood. Um, but this is the, um, the remnants of the destruction. So the disciples asked Jesus, teacher, when is this going to be? What will be the sign that this is about to take place? And Jesus says, beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he and the time is near. Do not go after them. And we want to think about that phrase, do not be led, you are not led astray. Um, we're going to, just to digress a little bit, though, it's not really, it's talking about this special word, which is planeo, is a verbal word or planos if it's in the um, noun form so it's used by Matthew quite a bit it's um, also found in some of the later pastoral letters and many um, are described as being deceived by false doctrines or false gospels and here it's about being led astray or being deceived so you can be planeoed by the planos so deceived by the deceiver basically Matthew also uses it as a noun later on in the story of um, looking at the temple when the priests say that imposter it's sometimes or that deceiver it's sometimes translated saying he would rise up again and they want Pilate to put a guard on the tomb. So it's also um, not only someone who deceives but in the noun form it can also mean like a sorcerer or a worker of magic and Matthew again uses um, Planeo when he talks about the sheep that has gone astray. So it's an unusual word with a strong meaning and it's really meant to warn people about being deceived by those who want to come and lead you astray for bad reasons. Um, so we thought that um, our first question for consideration tonight might be to think about uh, what Jesus is saying about his time and think about what the voices might be in our world today that are deceptive, that seek to lead us astray. Um, so Elizabeth is going to place you, I think, into breakout rooms now. I am. And you might I'll like just... to introduce yourself to. You might like to introduce yourself to one another, um, especially for those that are new to the the study group, and then um, have a, a bit of a think about that question. Okay then, apart from introducing ourselves, what did you think might be the voices in our world today that are deceptive? Politicians. <laughs> Politicians? <laughs> no. I'm sure there's some honest ones, but. <laughs> Few and far between. <laughs> Yes, and it's a bit of an irony that one of the greatest purveyors of fake news of the politician Donald Trump um, talked about being deceived by fake news. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of fake, there is a lot of fake news around COVID vaccines. I don't yes. Know. And that's very dangerous to people. Because mm -hmm. it's actually their health. Mm -hmm. They believe they're going to be infertile or they're going to die or the genetic code is going to be disrupted or something like that. Yes. Yeah. 
I think the polarization of the um, left and the right it tends to distorted messages at those wings. Mm. So there's not much we can trust there. And the media itself is uh, quite distorted. You can't rely on the media for factual news. Well, it's certainly getting harder. Mm. There's probably mm. some media I'd trust more than others, but it is getting harder. Mm. Any other, uh, apart from media and um, right-wing groups who are anti-vaxxers, did you come up with anything else? Yeah, ad ad advertising. Yes. Advertising. advertising. Oh, okay. Christmas. Yes, well, the whole advertising and Christmas thing goes together, doesn't it, really? Yeah. So the advertising, you think you're signing up for one thing and then you get bombarded with um, five more things every single day when you just wanted one. So. Yeah. And advertising oh, will tell you that if you just buy this product, you'll be beautiful and you'll be happy and, you know, <laughs> you'll look good and you'll get a new boyfriend and whatever it is it's promising you. There's all sorts of things like that. It hasn't worked. I have no new boyfriends and I'm not good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm disappointed, Bill. I thought you would have bought something that would have given you one. <laughs> one, one of our group, Elizabeth, uh, talked about the, the voices that promote self. Oh, yeah. <coughs> That's right. It was, I, I did a sermon one year on looking at this concept of advertising and how it appeals to our vanity. And I put in phrases like spoil yourself and it's all about you. And I got literally, hundred, you know, Millions and millions and millions of hits on those phrases. Mm. Um, and a lot of it, I would have said it was very deceptive about appealing to the self and probably the self of quite vulnerable people. Mm. The mm. other thing is we seem to have learnt a lot during COVID about what we didn't need in the materialistic terms. And now there's such a push for us to spend money to get the economy back on track that all those wonderful lessons of, of living more frugally um, are out the window yeah. yeah yes it's spend for the sake of the economy mm. make Australia great again by spending all your money yes <laughs> I mean after after lockdown the best thing that you could do was walk out and say hello to people and just mm. mix again. Uh, yeah. and, and you sort of forget that, but it was it was a strong, it was a strong thing for quite a while. Yes. yes. And just right. to have somebody come to your house like mm. another person was just <laughs> wonderful. It was a wonderful yes. feeling. Yes, we forget sometimes that there are simple things that probably give us a lot more joy. Than there mm. are, and there are many voices that would seek to deceive us in a variety of ways in our world today. Yes. All right, we're going to push on and have a look at Jesus the prophet. So Jesus then goes on to say, when you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. These things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. And then he talks about this great list of catastrophes, nation rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes, famines, plagues, portents, and signs. And I've included in the material that you received these, uh, these slides, but we just note that the threat of future wars is something that a number of the prophets talked about, starting with Isaiah and then Jeremiah and Daniel. And there's a very graphic um, in portrayal of the intensification that's that's predicted in, in a document called Second Baruch. It's a Jewish writing. It's not part of our Bible, but it comes in that intertestamental period. They shall come and make war with the leaders that shall be left. And then whoever gets safe out of the war will die in the earthquake. And whoever gets out of the earthquake will be burnt by the fire. And whoever gets safe out of the fire will be de destroyed by the famine. Um, so this uh, kind of language is um, is is found in other places. Earthquakes are um, attributed to God shaking the earth in, in a number of the prophets that you can see there and associated with that flashes of lightning uh, in, in those books. Um, what looked quite like an eclipse is regularly noted by the prophets a number of times in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Zephaniah, and then other writings subsequent to the 
Old Testament that are, that are listed there. And um, the darkness that comes in an eclipse takes us back to the chaotic origins of Genesis 1, the creation story that at the beginning, the earth was a formless void. Darkness covered the face of the deep. A wind from God swept over the face of the waters, evoked again in um, words of Jeremiah that are there. Um, for a number of the prophets, darkness is understood to be a sign of judgment coming from God. So Jesus um, uses all of these uh, things. He talks about all of these things. He uses all of this language in this speech, wars, earthquakes, famines, plagues, portents and signs. He is speaking as a typical apocalyptic prophet. That is to say, he's a person claiming to have insights into what the plans and intentions of God are. He believes that he's been gifted with this insight by the spirit. And so he is charged with speaking words of warning and encouragement to the people of his time. So this is a very fearsome, fiery Jesus. The image of the flames from the, the poem prayer at the start is, is pertinent. I wonder, is this how you normally think about Jesus? And how do you respond to this line of interpretation of Jesus, the fierce apocalyptic prophet? We'll go back into our groups to think about this uh, second question now for a little bit of time. Okay, how did you go with Jesus, the apocalyptic prophet? Did he surprise you? Did you expect him? Are you familiar with him? Jesus and the lamb. <laughs> you prefer Jesus as a lamb? Just a big no, old Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> we have to think of the context. Um, if he was speaking to the people in the temple, the, the remarks were aimed at them probably. Yep, so context is always important, as is history mm. and politics and society and culture and other things that are going on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Any other responses to Jesus, the apocalyptic prophet? Was anyone surprised by him? Mm. You all, oh, you were, you were Stephen? Mm. Mm. Um, no, I, no, I think it's interesting because for some denominations of Christianity, that might be the only aspect of Jesus that they know. Yeah. Mm. So I think it just depends on, you know, basically what church you go to. Yeah. And That's it, true. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's true. If you go to a seven day Adventist church, you'll meet Jesus the apocalyptic prophet quite a lot. Mm. Because yeah. that's kind of their thing to talk about that. Uh, we don't, we usually only meet him once a year in Advent. <laughs> and he pops up in the first week of Advent. We, we must forget him, I think. Oh, yeah. One of the scholars I used when I was doing my work on Matthew um, described Jesus as a prophet of frightening eschatological intensity. Oh, big word. It is, isn't it? And I, I was working with Matthew 24 at the time, which is Matthew's apocalyptic chapter. Mm -hmm. And I thought Ed Sanders was the name of this scholar. And I thought, yep, he's bang on the money. <laughs> because in this chapter, that's exactly what Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And we don't think of Jesus that way, do we? Not normally. Mm -hmm. But, but, but John said he's drawing on a long tradition of, of Old Testament references to this kind mm -hmm. of, you know, yes. things are going to change. Absolutely. Well, things are going he's, to have to change. <laughs> he's standing in the tradition of the prophets and he's announcing all the signs of what we'd call the day of the Lord, which we can find in various prophets throughout um, that section of the Old Testament. So, Elizabeth, could you say that he's frightening people or coercing people into, uh, you better see the light, guys, because things are going to happen? Um, probably. I think that's how it's meant to be written. Um, whether Jesus really did that, well, that's always up for grabs because we don't have um, his own account of it. But um, certainly they ask him what are the signs of the times and he pulls no punches in telling them. It's a very graphic description. But he doesn't really answer the question, though, does he? Like, we still don't know when the, like, when the end is going to be. He just says stuff's going to happen, but that's yeah. not, not going to be right. the end. We still don't know. 
except, except for that one little line that scholars have connections over, that little line that says, I tell you that some of this generation standing here will not taste death before I come back. Mm. Mm. That's a bit of a fly in our ointment, that one. Mm. Yeah. And as I said, scholars have turned themselves inside out over that line trying to explain what on earth it's doing there. Mm. <laughs> Elizabeth, one, one thought that I had was that, that the apocalypse that Jesus was talking about was in fact his own death and resurrection. Is um, that that that's often put forward as a theory. The problem we have with that is Jesus across a number of Gospels clearly describes himself returning on clouds with angels and trumpets. Mm. And that does not sit the, fit the stories we have of his death and resurrection. It does seem to be something quite different. Mm. So that is a problem with that too. Most theories have issues. They <laughs> fall down on one, one place or another because they don't quite fit everything we've got in front of us. Yeah. So this is something that's going to happen in the future. Well, that's a good question. And Was it meant to happen future. in the future? Yeah. Or was Jesus wrong? Because he says some of you will see this before you die. Well, clearly they didn't. Mm. Um, is Jesus yeah. wrong? He makes a mistake. We don't like that either. Mm. So it's a difficult passage. The whole <laughs> apocalyptic stuff is difficult because we've got these things in it we find uncomfortable and we have trouble explaining. That doesn't mean we shouldn't look at them, and I'm sure John is going to take you on to the next thing now in our apocalyptic um, in Luke. Yeah, so we also have reference to hatred and people being hated, people falling away from God, and also the sacred places will be, be despoiled, and we'll come back to that. And suffering and distress uh, um, um, signs in 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 many uh, apocalyptic books. Um, so, what we want to think about now is, I guess, what we've just been raising. What is this speech intended to describe? Is it describing what's happening at the time of Jesus? Is it describing what's going to happen in the years to come soon after Jesus is speaking? Is it a description of what will happen in 2000 years time? That is in our own time, as some interpreters want to say. Is it something that still lies ahead of us? What do you think we are intended to understand uh, about, with, about these dramatic scenes? Uh, uh, what were they intending to describe, do you think? Is Jesus talking about his own time, the immediate future, the long distance future, maybe whenever? <laughs> I certainly think there was, there was an element of his own time in it because mm. all that mm -hmm. stuff would have happened over and over mm. and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Yes. There's, always two, there's two time periods we're dealing with here. One is the time <coughs> of the story, and then there's the time of the actual writing. Yeah. Both of them are going to inform this passage. Mm. And is it linear? It's what, sorry, Bill? I'm just wondering whether it's all linear. Like we think of time as sort of something that's progressing out into the future, but maybe maybe it's just a way of interpreting the present. Yes. The prophets mostly did interpret the present. Oh. We forget about that. We think prophets, oh, they're talking about 200 years or something like that. No, no, they're not really. 10 years is probably the limit of their gamut um, when they're describing things. So... Oh. What was things that Jesus, sorry, the things that Jesus are talking about have happened for all of time. There's always been famines and earthquakes and diseases and, you know, that's, isn't he talking about all times? Well, there certainly has been end time signs, if you like, throughout history. We've had plagues and we've had storms and we've had all things that might be interpreted as portents of the end. None of them have been. But yeah. yes, you're right. They do keep occurring through time and people say the end is mm. nigh and it usually isn't. And so, but scientifically, we know what causes them these days. Yes. Like, so, yes. I mean, they're still threatening, mm. threatening us, but 
So what was happening in the time of Jesus? Jesus said these things though, aren't we? Sorry, what was that, Janet? We're talking as though Jesus said these things. Now, you know, if you read the Jesus yeah. seminar version, for example, they're emphatic that they're not his words. They were words addressed to the Markian community mm. and to encourage them, them to have faith and hope and to, and to stay together. Well, I'm going to take exception to the Jesus community on this one, and I'm going to say they're wrong. And I think that the apocalyptic sayings of Jesus probably are authentic. So I'm going out on a limb here, me versus the Jesus community, because this I think there's uh, the Jesus seminar, and because I think there's things in here that actually are authentic. Why do I think that? Because they're wrong. Why would you preserve something that is not accurate? unless Jesus really said it. Mm. That's I, I, I think it's because they are thoughts that have been around a long time, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, think about what's happening at the time of Jesus. Is are there his followers a... getting a good time? No. No, no probably not. No. What about at the time of Luke's writing? What's going on? Well, it is the persecution of the Christians. Uh, is the Roman Empire seen as the great, the incredible great force <laughs> that can just put anything under its boot and, yep. and conquer and kill and, and, you know, exert its rule no matter what. So how would those <coughs> things influence this, right, the writing of this, do you think? Sorry, what well, was the we'll, question? We'll answer our own question because I think John's going to address that in the next couple of segments. We'll keep moving on. Yes. Okay. <sighs> So um, then Jesus says some things which we do have some evidence to indicate did actually happen. Before all of this occurs, he says, they will arrest you and persecute you, hand you over to synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. Now, Luke, the person that wrote um, the gospel that we call by tradition Luke, uh, we know also wrote a second volume that we call the Acts of the Apostles. At the beginning of that, it refers back to in my first volume. Um, and in that book of Acts, there's a series of scenes where precisely this happens. So in a sense, Jesus is indicating things that are going to happen following on. Peter and John are brought before the council, the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem in chapter four, and they're interrogated. And then they are released. But then again, they're brought back in chapter five for a second time before the council, before they are let go. Stephen, of course, is then brought before the council in chapter six. Stephen makes what is actually the longest speech in the book of Acts, going for most of chapter seven. And that scene ends with Stephen being stoned to death. And he therefore becomes the first Christian martyr that we know of. Um, even in the time of Paul, there are various um, arrests and imprisonments and, and trials here. Paul and Silas are arrested in Philippi and thrown into prison. When he comes to Jerusalem after his third missionary journey, so-called, he's brought before the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. He's arrested uh, while he's there in the temple. And because he says that he is a Roman citizen, uh, it's decided that he needs to be sent to the Roman governor and then eventually to the Roman emperor. So in chapter 24, Paul is brought before the governor Felix, and then he's kept under arrest for another couple of years before the next governor Festus comes along and he appears before Festus along with King Agrippa and Queen Berenice in chapter 26. And from there, it is decided that he needs to go to Rome. So in a sense, Jesus is in this speech, in that, in that verse, saying something about what we have indications will in fact happen. And in the midst of all of that, he says, this will give you these arrests and trials. This will give you an opportunity to testify, make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. I'll give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. Um, so we thought it might be worth at this point picking up on that phrase, an opportunity to testify. And in the context that we are in, what do you think are the most important elements for us to have in mind when we come to an opportunity to testify to people in our own time? 
So we'll go back into breakout rooms okay. for that. And you're back. So we're going to push on um, because the next uh, section, Jesus talks about family division. You'll be betrayed by parents and brothers, relatives and friends. They'll put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. And then he says something that I really do not understand. Not a head, hair of your head will perish. I don't get that. Um, but then he says, but by your endurance, you will gain your souls. I think I understand that. Um, this sense of betrayal in the family is something we also find in the prophets. Um, in a Bible study John and I were doing in the morning, we discovered in Micah, we have not only the fig tree, because it mentions about summer and the fruit has been gathered and ripe figs. We also have son treating fathers with contempt and daughters rising up against mothers and daughter-in-laws against mother-in-laws, etc. So it looks like not only was this a situational thing where we could imagine that Jewish families um, were not happy about some of their members starting to follow Jesus, and so there were splits within the family, but also it has a prophetic basis that I only found out this week. So there you are. There's always room to learn something new, and this speech is again drawing on the prophet Micah. Is there like and it's also interesting that I think Greg had a question. John. Yeah, go on, Greg. No, I was going to say, isn't there? Sorry, yeah, I, think, yeah. I, I can't remember which book it is, but Jesus says something along the lines of, um, "He came to cause division, and there would be mother against father, yeah, yeah. sister against brother." I can't remember where that's from, but it was in the lectionary reading. Um, Luke, Luke twelve. Yeah, yeah oh, Luke 12. he does say that. Yeah. So it does have yeah, this old basis. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Also, say it when he goes and collects the disciples. In earlier in Matthew, um, he says Matthew it in all the synoptics, I think. But earlier, yeah, because yeah. Matthew and Luke change Mark's order, so okay, it does appear in different places. So just to like summarize where we're at, is it what we're kind of <laughs> sorry, like is it what we're kind of saying potentially is that this premonition or prophecy or whatever isn't like. It, it, the the time frame, the scope of the time frame is much narrower than we tend to take it to be. It's not like end of time sort of stuff, but it's more of within the context of the people that he was talking to at that time. So uh, it's, it's a kind of short, of, is that possible? It's kind of both, Greg, I think. Because mm. we talk about the not yet and the the already in the sense that the kingdom has come, but it's not completed and not here yet. I think there's a bit of that going on. Right, okay. Now, um, the next part of what Jesus says um, is interesting to compare with Mark and you have in your material, you have those parallel columns with Mark in the middle, Matthew on one side, but Luke on the left-hand side. And that's the, the version that we're particularly concerned with in, in this year. Um, so he talks about the, t the, the desolation of Jerusalem coming near when Jerusalem is surrounded by armies. When we compare this with what Mark says, it's quite interesting. In Mark, Jesus says, when you see the desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not to be, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Uh, in Luke, that's changed to when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know its desolation has come near. And the question is, what is this desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not to be? And the answer is that um, in the book of First Maccabees, um, it refers to an event that took place. Now, in the dating that it's using, the Jewish dating, it says the 15th day of Chislev in the 145th year. In our dating, that's the year 175 before the common era. And that's when Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, he was a Seleucid. He and his troops were dominant. They had uh, conquered uh, Jerusalem some years before. And, um, and now uh, what he was doing, his troops are doing, 
was erecting a desolating sacrilege that is an idol on the altar of burnt offering in the very heart of the temple. Um, Daniel talks about this in one of the visions that he has when he says the troops of the prince who is to come. Now, Daniel, of course, um, is allegedly set in an older time, but scholars believe that Daniel's prophecies really relate to the events that are happening under Antiochus Epiphanes. So although he's predicting, he's talking about the experience of living under Antiochus. So the, the troops of the prince who is to come shall destroy the sanctuary shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half the week he shall make sacrifice and offering cease and in their place shall be an abomination that desolates an image set up on the altar in the temple until the dec decreed end is poured out upon the desolator and of course that means by putting that image of a uh, not of Yahweh who's not supposed to have any image of, of Yahweh but putting the image of another of a pagan god that has um, desecrated the, uh, the the whole temple. It's no longer a holy place. Now that's the reference that Mark makes, and so G Mark has Jesus reports Jesus as kind of alluding back to that time um, from two centuries before, and saying that that's going to happen again perhaps. But Luke changes it in a very historically grounded way so he says when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies know its desolation has come near there will be great distress and wrath they will fall by the edge of the sword and be taken away as captive among all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled and we have a very um, clear indication about what this trampling on by the Gentiles was because in our dating on the 14th of April in the year 70, which was during the Passover, the Roman general Titus, who later on became emperor, laid siege to Jerusalem and eventually captured Jerusalem and captured the um, temple. And we, we know about this because it's referred to in Jewish and in Roman writings. And on his return to Rome, Vespasian and Titus and their soldiers celebrated a triumphal march and this is this arch that you can see in the picture has this uh, picture on it of captured Jews being brought into to Rome in celebration of the, the Roman victory. Uh, and we actually have, and this is in the material that I sent you, we have in the, the, the work of the Jewish war by Josephus, we have an account of um, the, um, the way in which the Romans surrounded the city, starved the Jews, into surrender and cut down all the trees around the, the city and um, so people were just surrendering in, in by the thousands and eventually this led to the sort of the sacking of the city as you do when you conquer a place um, and indeed the uh, the temple went up in flames and, and then was uh, was somewhat destroyed uh, and we saw the remains of that in one of the earlier pictures. So Josephus, who himself was a general fighting for the Jews against the Romans, when Josephus was captured, he kind of gave over to the Roman side and he lived another couple of decades and he wrote the story of the Jewish war and um, then indeed the whole history of the Jewish people. Um, so we have that information from Josephus about what happened. So this means that Jesus in about the year 30 is sitting in the temple talking about what's going to happen in the year 70 the temple is destroyed in probably the 80s or the 90s Luke writing his account of Jesus back in the 30s um, shapes what Jesus says in the light of what he knows has already happened so that's that's a really important perspective to grab hold of that we've got someone writing in the 80s about an event in the 70s which he uses to attribute to what Jesus was allegedly saying in, in the 30s. Now, um, the theological issue at the very heart of this is one that we can't avoid. Uh, Josephus makes it clear, Josephus who fought with the rebels of the Jews against the Romans, um, in the end came around to the point of view that the, the temple was destroyed, Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed 
because this was God's way of punishing the Jewish people for their lack of commitment and faithfulness to the covenant. And in a sense, Luke, he's having Jesus say that um, Jerusalem being trampled on by the Gentiles is part of these whole actions of God that are going to take place. So we have these two writers that are saying either explicitly or implicitly that the destruction, the catastrophic event of the destruction of Jerusalem and the, the, the pulling down of the temple is actually God at work punishing people for their sinfulness. And that's the question for us. What do we make of this line of interpretation? Is this actually something that we can accept uh, that this is the way God acts, this is the way God works, this is how God punishes us. So that's our next question for consideration. Do you want that in groups? Yes, I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is really the uh, climactic uh, section of the speech, and this is in our lectionary reading this Sunday about signs in the sun, the moon and the stars and distress among the nations, people fainting from fear and foreboding of what is coming. Uh, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory, using language drawn from Daniel uh, to evoke that scene. Then Jesus says, when these things begin to take place, stand up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Now, again, this is an interesting point that it's only in Luke's version of the speech that Jesus says this. And Luke actually has quite an interest in the notion of redemption. In the very first chapter of his story of Jesus, he's telling about um, Zechariah and Elizabeth finding out that Elizabeth is pregnant and that they will bear a, she'll bear a son whose name will be well known. He'll be John the Baptist. And um, Zechariah says when he learns this, that he blesses God and says that God has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. And then there's a kind of a companion piece to that in chapter two, when Jesus has been born and is brought as a tiny infant into the temple. And there Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, she was a prophet. Uh, she was there day and night fasting and praying. She began to praise and to speak about the child <coughs> as uh, those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. So the implication is, that Jesus is bringing that redemption. John and Jesus together are seen even from the beginnings of their life in this looking back on it as being um, figures of redemption. Indeed, in one of the very um, well-known and, and much beloved parts of Luke's gospel, the road to Emmaus story, uh, the, two, the two people that are walking with the stranger who they haven't yet identified with Jesus are asked by the stranger what we're you talking about and they say we were talking about Jesus a prophet mighty in deed and word before God we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel um, so they had this hope that Jesus was the one to redeem so at the beginning and the end of his story Luke makes it clear that he sees I think that Jesus brings this redemption from God and those of you who were in the uh, wisdom series may remember that we talked about redemption and redeemer um, in the sessions on Ruth just to remind you of that but um, we thought it was worth pondering what does the word redemption mean to you in your understanding in your life in your um, dis discipleship what is redemption about if, I, if I'm being redeemed, I guess I'm being saved from something. <laughs> yes, that's being a good point. Saved, being protected. Interesting that it starts with the prefix re, which means back. So to deem back. Deem back, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Um, in that sense, rather than say, what's, you, you're orientated to god's way i suppose to, to to the road that god would have us travel mm. 
but that implies that the starting point was a perfect place or perfection. I don't think so. And somehow we've moved away from that, doesn't it? It's certainly we've moved away from the the way that God would have us travel. Mm. We've taken the wrong path and he wants us to go back and take the right path. Okay. I would see it as rather Mm. than this perfect place. Mm. See it as wholeness. Wholeness, is that what you said, Jim? Yes. Yes. So I can't see part of you kind of turning whole. around. Yeah, well, that's like the, we'll meet that with John the Baptist, the turning around with the term metanoia. And everyone in Tuggeranong should be able to tell you what that means. Isn't that right, Tuggeranong? <laughs> metanoia, to repent. Uh, it's coming your up life next week. Around. But... That will be coming next week. To pent back. To pent back, yes. <laughs> But I was also thinking in terms of the, the, you know, the everyday version of redemption, you know, redeeming something belongs to getting something back from cash converters or the pawnbroker. I mean, yeah. you're getting it back. <laughs> you're coming yeah. back again. Yeah. So what was meant by redeeming Israel, though? Was, was it redeeming, was it, um, I don't know, giving the nation a chance to change or what? what? Yes, it's certainly got national connotations, yeah. Yeah. And Israel is given all these chances by God in the scriptures that keeps talking about, you know, um, you, you turned from me and I brought you back and I have redeemed you. There's a lot of that language in there. Because the language of redemption um, is, is all through the um, Israelite laws about redeeming land and redeeming all sorts of things that they pass amongst themselves. Mm. So it's got a quite a legal kind of concept about it as well as um, the more abstract concepts we think about as Christians. It was a song we used to sing, um, I have redeemed you and called you by name, child, you are mine, Mm. which Mm. is nicely. Which is kind of I've saved you, I suppose, in that context. Mm. or what we understand as saved to be. And even that's up for grabs, really. Any other comments? I think of it somehow like a second chance. You've messed things up quite badly, but there is a way you can actually relearn and re uh, 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 and become come back to a state of grace, a state of sort of being able to live with uh, the things you've done wrong, but okay at the same time. Mm. Mm. I'm just looking up um, the meaning, the actual meaning of redeem in the dictionary. And there's a couple there that really stand out, like to restore the honour, worth or reputation of, um, to set free as from slavery, mm. uh, to sort of buy back um, in, and reclaim ownership, like part buying something back. Mm-hmm. So those things all, to me, seem to speak to that type mm. of redemption that's yeah. mentioned there. Yeah. So after talking about redemption, Jesus then turns to the fig tree. Look at the fig tree. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near so too when you see these things you know the kingdom of god is near Um, now here's that verse that elizabeth was referring to earlier i tell you that this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place taken at face value that's not the case that generation did in fact pass away and many other sins have passed away heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away says jesus and then he warns people to be on guard so that their hearts not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of the life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly. And that day is a, another motif um, that is strong in the prophetic uh, speaking about the day of the Lord that will come. 
he says, be alert at all times, be on guard, be alert, that you may have strength to escape all these things, to stand before the Son of Man. And that's, of course, the, the, the judgment scene um, that Daniel is talking about and that, that Jesus um, is evoking here. And that's basically where the speech ends in Luke's version and, and also in um, Mark's version. In Matthew's version, we're not that we're looking at Matthew this year, but just to notice that at this point in Matthew, Jesus starts telling a series of parables. He tells a parable about the master that returns unexpectedly and the slave needs to be prepared for that. He tells uh, the parable about the 10 wise, the, the five wise and five foolish maidens with their oil lamps and those that did have oil and those that didn't. And he tells the story about the talents and those that just buried the talents and those that put them to work. And then the, the last climactic parable in Matthew's gospel, that scene of judgment. Uh, as the son of man judges the sheep and the goats. Um, so Matthew tells us here a whole lot more about what Jesus, he says, was saying in this speech, but Luke and Mark end it there. Now, interestingly, what Luke does do, that you will see in your parallel columns, is that he has a kind of narrative conclusion to the speech. You remember that I said at the beginning that Jesus was in the temple talking about the destruction of the temple. Well, at the end of this speech, Luke says that every day he was teaching in the temple. And at night he would go out, spend the night on the Mount of Olives, and then he and all the people would get up early in the morning to come back and he would, they would listen to him in the temple. And that's where the scene ends, still in the temple with Jesus teaching. Luke doesn't tell us what Jesus was teaching. Um, Matthew does actually provide that long list of, of parables there. Uh, in, in Luke's whole story, the temple is really important. Of course, we, we know, we immediately connect Jesus and the temple in Christian tradition with that story in the middle of that, that um, block on the right-hand side, the cleansing of the merchants in the temple forecourts where Jesus comes into Jerusalem and overturns the tables, etc. And then he... Um, sort of sets up camp there and teaches in the temple. But uh, we know that in, in when we read Luke's gospel thinking about the temple, the very the first eyes. scene, the very first character that we meet in Luke chapter one is Zechariah, who will become the father of John the Baptist. Zechariah was a priest and he was taking his turn in the annual rotation of, of priests at the temple. And then we meet in chapter two, Simeon and Anna in the temple when the infant Jesus is brought to the temple and Jesus then is uh, purified. And uh, we only have told in Luke's gospel, the inquisitive young man, the, the, the 14 year old man, Jesus, who had gone with his family to, pass, uh, to Jerusalem for Passover, got separated from his family and um, they found him in the temple debating with the teachers of the law. Jesus refers to the temple in, in the temptation, of course. But after Jesus' um, death and um, burial and then resurrection, uh, Luke says that the followers of Jesus continue to attend the temple. In chapter 2 and in chapter 4, they are there in the temple day by day. And it's the temple that brings Stephen to grief. Um, it's his criticism of the temple. In, in before the Sanhedrin that leads to him being martyred. And of course, as I've mentioned before, when Paul is arrested in chapter 21, he's actually been taking part in a four day ritual in the temple when he's arrested and eventually sent to Rome. So the, um, the temple continues to have um, a, a dominance in Luke's view of things. Now we know that Luke was writing after the destruction of the temple in the eighties, maybe even in the nineties, the temple's destroyed in the 70s, and yet still the temple stands as a, a potent symbol to Luke and presumably to Jews, uh, a symbol for what Judaism was, was about. Um, so Luke's story is really interesting in, the, in that the, eventually the focus shifts from the temple to Rome, the centre of the dominant empire, which is where uh, Paul ends at the end of end of Acts, so that's how Luke ends this this story, sort of bringing us back into um, Jesus' teaching in the temple. Well, that's um, been um, our 
hop, skip and a jump and run and scurry through chapter 21 of Luke, um, doing some comparisons with, Matt, with Mark and seeing where Jesus uses prophetic material. Mm. Um, next week, the apocalyptic tone continues with the voice crying in the wilderness, who is John the baptizer. And so we've just got those first six verses of chapter three of Luke next week. And then the week after there is the teachings of John that, that we will look at. And as I've said to you in my email, um, we have a friend who is an American professor of uh, religion, teaching biblical studies in Indiana, who will be joining the morning group live. Of course, the timing just doesn't work for the evening group, but we're planning to record an interview with him during that morning session. So we'll play that for you in the evening session. Um, and you can listen to James talking about John the Baptist, which is one of his areas of uh, real expertise. expertise.